Cycling Fashion Week, the only global podcast that analyzes and discusses cycling purely from an aesthetic design and entirely superficial point of view. I'm your host, Alex. I am joined by my regular co-hosts, Warren and Tony. And this week, we have a very special episode because we have a guest on the podcast. We have film and television costumer and fashion designer Erin Logan joining us. And what we're going to do with Erin is she will give us her fashion designer perspectives on a variety of cycling kits and cycling fashion items that we all wear and like overall or things that we're discussing, things that are coming from the pro peloton. The idea on today's episode is to get fresh outsider perspectives from a design point of view on cycling fashion because again we all live in our own little echo chambers and bubbles of cyclists that all wear the same kits and thinks it's extremely cool so what we're going to do today is get an actual fashion designer to take a look at these cycling kits and tell us what she thinks so that's coming later on the podcast today aaron logan will join us to discuss that you'll recall last episode we had our european correspondent harry ashman join the podcast and harry actually had a very important scoop on one of the pro kits that had not been released by the time we put out the podcast, and that was the EF Easy Post kit, and probably one of the more anticipated pro kits to come out of the 2022 World Tour. They've always had perhaps some of the more interesting kits. They're made by Rafa. They probably get more people talking. And what Harry mentioned on the last podcast, if you haven't listened to it, go back to Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Make sure you follow us there and review us there. Essentially, what Harry said was he has a scoop and that the kit was going to be green. This was a big thing. It was a return to their Cannondale Draypack days. He said, gentlemen, guys, the kit is not going to be pink. It's going to be green. And so we put that out on the podcast and we said that we were maybe going to have a scoop and I'm very happy to report today that we maybe have a half scoop because it looks like the bibs judging from the photos that came out of the kit the bibs were maybe green it's big debate on Instagram are they navy are they green are they forest green are they British racing green we don't know but it looks like they might be green so we will chalk that up to our first ever cycling fashion week scoop which I'm, I'm very proud of personally it's definitely a half scoop and i mean there's little touches of i would call it an emerald green i think i've i've seen that thrown around somewhere and there's also like little splotches of it in the jersey it's not just the bibs you know at a minimum it's a three-quarter scoop but i i think we can just call it a full-on scoop and i also feel like i need to to mention that we tweeted about this with the cycling fashion week account and Jonathan Vodders actually responded and gave a half answer as to whether or not it was actually uh, green. He didn't. He didn't deny that it was green. No, exactly. He did not deny it was green. So, to me, that's a scoop. It's a hundred percent green. It's a hundred percent green. I mean, the bibs are one hundred percent. They are green. Lighting can sort of affect color stuff, but it's they're green bibs with some green accents in the pink jersey. Warden's right. We're about three quarter scoop. Next one's going to be a full scoop. Half scoop, which I think is perfect for our half ass journalistic standards on this podcast. We've always said we're, we're not a we're not an accuracy podcast. We're a hot takes podcast. Harry brought the scoop, so I said go back and listen to the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review there. Give us one star, two star, hopefully five stars. And actually, one thing that came up when we were looking at some of the reviews. First of all, we didn't even know there were reviews, but we saw that one of the reviews there described our podcast as straddling a very fine line between elitism and satire. And honestly, this is the best compliment that we could be given. I think that if we were to describe the podcast, that is probably the best way to do it. Also, please only give five stars. Yeah, don't give us one or two. Give us a good review. That helps us. Bad reviews don't. So yeah. back to the EF Easy Post kit. Another thing that kind of caught my attention. So this is made by Rafa. There's a lot of splatter paint on this on this jersey. 
And in the meantime, Rafa released a limited edition collection created in collaboration with one of the writers of EF Easy Post, the Australian writer Lachlan Morton, very active on SWAT. I, mean, I was going to say social media, but maybe not. I guess more active in the film space or on YouTube or Vimeo, filming himself, participating in alt races, I guess you could call them gravel racing. So Lachlan was, was very big on the world tour and kind of took a slight detour via these alternative races. So Rafa released this kit with Lachlan Morton. And I, I mentioned the splatter paint because this also has splatter paint. It's essentially black, but it's got some gold and green paint splattered on it. So kind of like if Jackson Pollock designed a, a cycling kit or Jean-Paul Riopelle, who is another painter who enjoyed this sort of splatter paint. So Rafa made this and guys, I got one thought on this kit and I'm, I'm actually concerned a little bit about where things are going for cycling fashion, because if you go back maybe 10 years ago in the world of craft beer, when, you know, craft beer obviously started before that, but 10 years ago, I would say is roughly when the IPA trend started. And initially it was enjoyable. You were going out to a bar, you were ordering this IPA from a craft brewery that you didn't really know. And there was this kind of interesting tingle of bitterness on, on your tongue. And you were thinking, oh, this is this is nice. I, you know, I could enjoy it. I enjoy this. And over the years, the, the craft beer industry kind of ran that trend into the ground. And I'm a little concerned that cycling fashion brands right now or kid brands are going to run the splatter paint trend into the ground. There's just so much of it coming out right now. And it's it's almost like a like a spectrum where on the one hand it has to be Panama Studios and on the other hand it has to be splatter paint and it seems like the the dial or the pendulum is shifting to the splatter paint and I, I'm already kind of sick of it. I feel like we're gonna run this thing into the ground. I want to make it extremely clear here to everyone listening that at no point in my life have I ever enjoyed a craft beer. This whatever Alex said about 10 years ago enjoying an IPA, I've never done that. They're disgusting. I hate everything about it. Well, I think when the IPAs were more moderate when the trends started, I, th I think it was interesting. It was enjoyable. Now, the problem is that over those 10 years, as I mentioned, the craft beer makers ran that thing into the ground by coming up with double IPAs, triple IPAs. They just went more and more IPA, and then it became disgusting. Actually, the same thing about three years ago, I would say happened with sour beers. So initially you would go to a bar, you'd order a sour beer. And again, there was that little sour on your tongue, which was, which was interesting. And now it's like, I mean, it's basically lemonade without the sugar and it's, it's just too much. If this is about to become a craft beer podcast, I got to walk out of the studio. <laughs> I, I'm, done. I'm done. So I get where you're trying to go with the analogy, but no, where, where you know it's it's not going to be a craft beer podcast because I'm here and I'm I'm a crispy boy only, and and all you craft beer drinkers out there, let's admit it, you find it disgusting. I I started a job years ago and I went there where, where the office was near a craft brewery here in Toronto and everyone was craft brewing. Oh, yeah, I get this, and I'm like, this is just undrinkable. I don't know what you're talking about. And then finally, at one of the sort of office get-togethers, I, I I went to the LCBO, the liquor store here in Ontario. And I just grabbed some Coors Banquet. It's, it's you know, I just brought it in. And the next thing you know, that craft beer sitting in the fridge. Everyone's crushing Coors Banquet. Because the reality is, that's the better beer. A Crispy Boy, a Miller High Life, a Budweiser, a Michelob Ultra, which is Lance's beer, by the way. That's what made him fast. So let's get this straight. Nobody likes craft beer. You're just pretentious, but not in the fun, like, cycling pretentious way, in the, like, annoying, like, paper boy hat pretentious way. Tony has sort of two sides to his personality. He has the very cycling pretentious elitist style, but in every other aspect of Tony's life, he cultivates this working man, man of the people image, and his craft beer crispy boy take embodies this this image that he cultivates so for our listeners we're getting into a little bit of personality here but tony has this dr jekyll and mr hyde personality where the cycling elitism clashes with the every man working man man of the people aspect in his other areas of his life i think this conversation is more interesting than the lachlan morton kit so that's kind of the extent of my thoughts i'm tired looking at it i i 
don't really talk about it. There's also a limited edition uh, Super Sex Evo SE frame set in this splatter thing, and it's seven thousand uh, dollars. So good on you, Lachlan. Get that. Get that money. I think we're going to be a no on that special edition kit. Go drink a crispy boy. Okay, for our next segment, we welcome a very special guest on the podcast. Her name is Erin Logan, and she is a film and television costumer. So what we're going to do with Erin is we are going to run several items of cycling fashion by her to get someone's opinion who works in the fashion industry, someone who has a keen sense for fashion and design, but isn't necessarily so caught up in the cycling world as we are in order to get her take on what cycling fashion looks like from an outside perspective, because we live in our little echo chamber, our little bubble of cyclists who all think that our kits are the coolest thing, but we really wanted to get someone from the fashion world's perspective on Cycling Kit. Erin, welcome to Cycling Fashion Week and thank you for joining us. Hey y'all, thanks for having me. I'm stoked. Erin, can you, before we go into this, can you describe a little bit what your job is as a film and television costumer? For sure. So I started as a background actor and I accidentally fell into film and TV costumes. And yeah, it's been a wild year of, uh, of exploration. Aaron, do you now do you have any history personally with cycling as a sport? So currently my stand up bike is surrounded in bags of clothing from past productions. Um, and my bike tire popped in the middle of summer while I was drunk listening to Fifth Harmony biking to Bickford Park, there was a really concerned group of people who stopped and tried to get my attention (laughs) when I ran over a pile of glass. So yeah, that's about the extent of my cycling experience. And I still haven't gotten that tire fixed. So I think we can safely say we got someone from the outside looking at cycling kit. And that's what we're we're going to do today. So just for our listeners, what we're going to do is we we sent Aaron a bunch of picks of several brands that are currently let's say that are cool in the cycling world or that definitely that cyclists like and we'll get Aaron's take on the design aspects and the fashion aspects of each of them so let's start with the first one Aaron if you if you would like the first brand that we sent you picks of is a brand called Panormal Studios they are from Denmark They are very popular with cyclists currently. So what did you think of these pictures that we sent you from Panorama Studios? All right. So two words, Italian Alex. I actually have a picture of him on my fridge. We're on a patio in the good old days, and he's wearing the bright yellow shirt and just really smug smile. There's something about this brand. It is just hot person. Hot person, in quotes, maybe a bit acne adjacent, but, you know, simplified sporty. Something about a sans serif font really gets me going. And you can see this person walking around town carrying a Sam James Cortado, and they're going to talk you into listening to Arthur Russell and Dean Blunt like no problem. This is, you know what? I can't lie. We know it. I've been on the Essence website. I've fallen for it. I don't personally own anything, but this is the number one, in my opinion, in cycling fashion. The the music choices, Dean Blunt, Arthur Russell, I, I didn't see that personally myself with Panama Studios, but definitely hot person cycling fashion. I, I can see that. And, and shout out to our guy, Italian Alex, who I guess was just named a hot person on this podcast yeah. today. I mean, he is. I don't, I don't own any Panama, so... <laughs> what? Well, I'm, I'm telling it. you, Essence Sale, it comes back around every season. Bookmark the tab. Keep looking. The Arthur Russell reference, to me, that's a little more like Cafe du Cyclist uh, or some brand like that. Like it's uh, the acne uh, reference was like perfect, right? Because it, that is, it's both sort of this niche fashion brand while also being super mainstream. I mean, they've got a Soho, New York, you know, store. They're, they're, they're not a they're not a small time thing, but there's this kind of like element to it that feels 
it's like fashion for people who sort of know fashion, but also for just rich people. So I think it was dead on. I would have associated Panormal with German electronic music, German minimal house. That's what I would have seen personally. But all right, let's move on to the next brand that we shared with Aaron. The next one is Rafa, very popular British brand. They probably started British. the whole cycling fashion thing. Rafa, what, it, what, what comes to mind, Aaron, when you look at Rafa? Really? Okay, I feel bad. I looked at the website and I went through and I just really looked for something that I would maybe like. In the picture you sent me, okay, so we're looking at a jersey and it's got like this blue with this black and this pink pale and this orange pale kind of scene happening, right? And all I could think about was Beyonce's 2013 H&M collaboration. There's a specific dress that she's wearing that's got like this mountain on it. And my God, it's the worst polyester material ever. And you know what? These are my colors. I love them. And I appreciate that they do some colors and they do some fun designs. But it's just, it's 2021. I'd like, we need more innovation here, people. I know, I know Aaron hasn't listened to our podcast, but it's like she has, because I'm pretty sure that's that's our take on Rafa. Like, go back to old Rafa. That was exciting back then. And they haven't really been able to sort of like push forward and innovate. So, But it's really interesting because if I, if I translate what Aaron said, perhaps the one word that comes out would be cheap in my opinion like you said the cheapest polyester terrible material yeah and i feel like the the good folks over at rafa global headquarters if they listen to that that's probably the opposite of what they want to hear they don't want to sound like a cheap brand they're in fact quite expensive if you look at it overall and i think they would pride themselves on the quality of their materials so i think it's a pretty pretty dangerous thing if that is the perception that people have of their brand that would be pretty concerning if i if i was rafa i am so embarrassed right now if anyone's listening they should see my face i will say i did look them up and i did see some moisture wicking i saw some f spf so this is more in relation to the beyonce dress but listen there is something about it that just it's i don't want to touch it however i'm just a guest on the <laughs> podcast please feel free to give them a sponsorship that's that's a very good take overall very interesting take actually on rafa i, I probably did not expect that but that's that's good let's move on to the next one the next one is an australian brand called MAP, M-A-A-P. They have been around for a while. They're quite liked worldwide. I think we like them on this podcast overall. We own some MAP. We proudly wear it. We find that they've, they've innovated over the years. So Aaron, what did you think about MAP? Okay. You know what? On We like MAP on this podcast. Um, I wrote down in my notes, I can't diss them because I'm loving the accessories. I'd maybe wear the black logo zip up to a rave. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate the size of their pockets. They're like perfect to reach into and grab a cliff bar. Yeah. That po pocket uh, pocket design is a, is a, you know, the devil's in the details. If it's, oh, yeah. it's got to be... It's got to be right. It's got to be the right height. It's got to fit stuff while it, being easily accessible while you're riding. I personally find cliff bars hard to eat while cycling, but that's a well. You that's a whole other. You start the thing is you open the cliff bar when you start the ride, and you can finish chewing it by the end of the ride. And Aaron, what did you think about the the off the bike stuff from Map? There's that photo we sent you. Oh baby, of a sort of winter winter jacket or fall spring mid season jacket with a hoodie. Like, what did you think of that? I let me just double check there's one piece in particular that i actually have added to the cart and can we just clarify if someone is not a cyclist but they are taking part in cycling fashion what's the vibe there are you disappointed is it appreciation i'd be more curious where they found it okay i think it's great if someone is not a cyclist but is taking part in cycling fashion i mean it's brings some new blood into the game, new ideas, fresh perspectives, more interest into the the stuff that we're interested in. So I'm I'm all I'm all for it. Love to hear it. Oh, I, I mean I know that uh cycling shorts were very popular among mm -hmm. uh uh you know women last summer, I'm sure some men too, but in terms of more of a casual thing for you know these brands we're talking about the the hardcore cyclists and they, unfortunately they have a chamois in them, which both from sort of comfort and look would be probably awkward as a casual wear. Uh -huh. You sort of need the chamois-less sort of 
biker tight that Kim Kardashian is wearing. If you were to, you know, put on a pair of map tights, even if they were sort of simple black, you would have this sort of diaper uh, underneath you would not look as good as well. I think, you know, no cyclist has ever walked more than 12 feet in a pair of cycling shorts. So I don't know you know, what an extensive walk would feel like in cycling shorts. Well, I can tell you right now in my experience, for me, fantastic. Great leisure pant. Love it. What music do map owners listen to? Oh, oh no. What music do y'all listen to out of curiosity? I feel like, well, I'll answer that, but I feel like map, map wearers listen to hip hop from the early 2000s. Ooh. Jay Dilla, they are big Jay Dilla fans. I think that's the map people. We will have to go with that. <laughs> are we RIP R. Jay Dilla? Are we uh, are we answering the question about our music? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you must have good taste. Everyone sad are... boy sad boy tunes. I think yeah. I think we covered this. I listened to sad boy tunes on the trailer. Or on the on the trainer, I listen to Sad Boy tunes all the time. I've already put out that I listen to Feist while doing my trainer rides, which oh. uh, it's actually Italian Alex specifically called me a psychopath. <laughs> well, I listen to Feist in the car, so I mean, I'm not putting in too much work, but it is good movement music. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to the next brand that we shared with Aaron. It's a British brand. They're called Albion. We shared some photos with Aaron of some of the latest kits that they came out with. Aaron, what did you think of Albion? Okay, what I love most about this is that you only sent me pictures in that god-awful mustard color. Also, I'm sorry, it's spring summer. Well, are we, we're moving into spring summer, right? This is like a fall, strictly fall. I don't want to see this color in winter unless you're the crossing guard. I have written down yellow Ikea bag chic. Does anyone remember those? The ones that you get at the marketplace? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I also have written down, does the jacket even do anything? For context, it's the really, it's one of the thin insulated uh, jackets, I, I think that we shared with, with you. And um, I will say like, you wouldn't know this. This is a favored brand of the podcast. We actually oh. interviewed the founders a few <laughs> months ago. No, don't worry. It's, it's, it's fine. We said we were looking for hot takes. We got I'm, hot yeah, takes. Yeah. This is what we signed up for. But what I was going to say is that they're a UK brand. So you're you're wondering about the like, you know, we're going into spring, summer. But I think uh, summer in the UK is, you know, fall, winter. I think the UK the is basically fall all year long. So they get a pass on that burnt yellow color that you don't like. I think they actually call it burnt yellow, not mustard. But yeah. I, I get I get your point on the mustard. It's funny because so far I've liked your takes, Aaron, but I absolutely love this burnt yellow. I love okay. the color of it. I don't know why. And also, I just want to make sure so we're not getting emails. We understand that the Brits call it autumn and not fall. We know that. We're smart people. Okay, so you, so Aaron, I take it you're not a huge fan of, of Albion. You know what? I... I should be looking a little bit more. Let's be real here. I'll give the, I'll give them that. Here's the thing. In all of these things that I've been looking at, or all these things that we've been looking at together collectively just now, everything, like the silhouettes, the cuts, everything is good. And everything is super, like, I'll look at that and I'll be like, oh, that's a cyclist. There's nothing wrong there. I do have one question, though. Do the heads of cycling fashion get together and strictly pick four colors that they're all going to use every <laughs> year? Because I have noticed only i mean besides black obviously yellow orange green and purple so this is where your sort of comment about you know pat or mal makes the most sense is that they are the driving force uh -huh. they're the kings you know they're the anna winter of uh <laughs> of, of cycling fashion and so when they sort of establish the color palette everyone else just follows and there's some, like the companies we've showed you, Map and Albion and Rafa kind of still have like a little bit of their own thing. There's some companies out there that basically almost look like they just like go to Pat Mal's website and be like, okay, let's just take that and put our logo on it because it looks mm -hmm. all, like the color palette's almost identical. So really like Pat Mal, that's probably why they're on Essence. Yeah. So your answer is there, Pat Mal drives it. So what their color palette is, is essentially everyone's other color palette, everyone, everyone else's color palette. 
it, I'm realizing it, it was it's maybe a, a missed opportunity for us to not get you to look at a brand like Pearl Azumi or something like that, because we kind of gave you a well curated uh, collection Selection. of some of the the uh, top brands of the moment. And Pearl Azumi is sort of like the uh, maybe not Walmart brand. That's a little low, but uh, yeah, they're they're a little bit outside the scope of Cycling Fashion Week. But no, I know, but I, I feel like. We should have just given her a, sure. a bad brand <laughs> to look at. I think more less it's a bad brand. It's more one that's like not going to follow trends, right? Like they've kind of done the same thing forever because they're this sort of, they're, you know, they're very more, they're sort of a little bit cheaper price point, popular with entry level stuff. They actually do. I have some Pearl Zume bibs I really like, but so they're not, you're not going to kind of see that trend of the color palette and the design. It's kind of going to always be like the same thing, which is like unstylish for sure. But it's like a Pro Zume's jersey you bought in 2002 is going to look exactly the same as one you bought in 2022. Like they're not yeah. going to change it. I'm looking at it right now, and all I can say is sport check. <laughs> Absolutely, that's absolutely like, yeah. There you nailed go. it. Okay. So for our international listeners, sport check. Sport check is a large chain, large Canadian chain of sporting goods. I don't know what the equivalent would be in like America or Dick's Sporting Goods. Yeah, Dick's yeah. Models, Dick's Sporting yeah. Goods. Dick's Sporting like Goods is pretty yeah. spot on. There we go. All right, let's move on to the next segment. What we're going to do here is we'll get Aaron to opine on some very classic pro cycling kits from the past. So if, if our listeners have been following pro cycling for a while, you obviously remember some of the important kits that have come out over the years. And we have some pretty classic ones to discuss with Aaron, but we'll start with actually a pretty aggressive, pretty ridiculous one, which is the Rock Racing 2008 kit. You'll recall that Tyler Hamilton was a part of that team in, in his in the twilight of his career, as was Mario Cipollini, the greatest sprinter of all time. So Aaron, what, what comes to mind when you look at the 2008 rock racing kit? Let me tell you, this is my favorite one. There's a picture you. that you have sent me and it's three guys, you know, they're all like grouped together, gray stormy background. They've got this electric, it's basically a monster energy Ed Hardy collab. And they're just doing this, like this pose you know camera on the ground and it is giving me spotify hyper pop uh playlist cover so i think this team was started by this guy michael ball who owned i don't know if they're still around calling coming called uh i think it's called rock and rebellion or oh. i have to let me double check what it's sorry let me double check again rock and republic sorry rock and republic and they are essentially in that ed hardy von dutch sort of mold right they made the they, you know they're very popular for these jeans with lots going on lots of style this kit was designed i'm sure by michael ball very specifically to help push his uh you know his clothing company so the fact that you picked up on like that's the vibe for it i'm sure he would michael ball would be very excited kudos to michael ball also quick interjection i was hoping you'd say rock and republic um, I used to work at a buy, sell, trade clothing store maybe like six years ago. Oh, no, we're going to say this was like eight years ago now. Time flies when you're not having fun. Uh, but we would get Rock and Republic jeans in and we'd price them like mega high. Like we'd be reselling them for like, you know, a little higher than we should. And guess what? People loved them. People didn't mind the low rise. You know, there was something for everyone there, but Rock and Republic rocked us. They were one of our best selling brands. I mean, that's why I would wear this kit. Like of all the former pro kits, I would, I'm sure I can probably find a replica or maybe like a, a vintage, you know, one on eBay or something. But like, I would rock this kit so hard on a group ride. Like it's just such an iconic kit. And I think the team was full of dopers and there was just like, this was just like a wild team. I don't know if it lasted very long. I think it was just caught at UCI Continental, but. So Tony, if you want to buy it, just go to rockracing.us. They still sell <laughs> rock racing. What? I think you're not. Yeah, they sell the 2007 to 2010 oh, no. vintage kits. They had, they called the Anarchy kit. That's the one that wow. had the sort of skull on it. Uh, that's probably the most Ed Hardy-esque of the bunch they have the body armor kit which is the one we were discussing here with the electric green that looks like it was made by someone drinking monster energy while advertising for monster energy there's so much testosterone in that kit it's 
it's incredible. I yeah, I love I love it. It's fantastic. Oh, look at the 2007 all black OG point one or the 2010 rock racing predator like this is cycling i'm not gonna lie i am like aggressively clicking the link to buy now on the body armor snake green because i need more details and it is not linking me anywhere so if rock <laughs> racing you are listening to this please get your website under control because i don't want to take my business to ebay i feel like you show up you show up to an office park crit wearing a rock racing kit on an aluminum while riding an aluminum bike it's just so perfect i i love it in a very ironic way obviously but i it, it just holds a special special place in my heart if rock racing is listening uh please also sponsor us we'll absolutely wear the kit last thing i'll make that a quick summer goal aluminum bike rock racing kit uh well, let's give a shout here at toronto midweek crit that's a that's a that's a summer goal. I'll, I'll I'll maybe film it for people if I end up doing it. All right, next classic pro kit that we asked Aaron to review or opine on from a purely fashion perspective is the extremely iconic U.S. Postal Service 2002 kit. So everyone knows that kit, the, the blue train, the iconic blue, red, and black kit of the United States Postal Service team. Aaron, what did you think about that one? Okay, can you imagine if male people actually wore this? I feel like things would just get done 10 times faster. There is something about this that just speaks efficiency. And I'm curious as to if there's any scannable barcodes um, or a spot to maybe put some stamps. Uh, the only thing they had room for was uh, EPO, I think, in these outfits. Blood bags as well. Bla blood bags yeah. of their own blood for blood transfusions that they were carrying carrying around in motorcycles behind mm -hmm. the peloton at races. This is uh, just for Aaron's benefit. This is probably the the greatest doping operation of all time. So when you talk about oh. efficiency, I think yeah. you, you kind of hit it on the on the head. This was Lance Armstrong's team. Uh-huh. Okay. The one cyclist I have uh, heard of. The one cyclist you know and know that he was on Oprah telling everybody that he doped and essentially was the most efficient doper yeah, that's ever existed. He he won doping. Right on. Someone had to be. That's amazing. So the next vintage pro kit that we're going to look at now is the Phonak kit. So you'll recall Phonak as a team where a bunch of washed up pro cyclists kind of ended their career. Think of Floyd Landis. Phonak was was a team that I think became BMC after. What happens with the Phonak kit here is it's a white jersey with green, yellow, and black lines around it or on the jersey and on the bibs. The bibs have this interesting shape where it makes a triangular shape that where the the tip of the triangle ends exactly below the men's genital parts yeah it creates you can say crotches, it crotches yes or you know yeah, men, men parts um, uh, yeah. i'm a i'm a second language english speaker so i'm not i'm not clear on how to describe that in a in a proper way but it creates that tri triangle right below their crotches that is green and the quads or the the the, the thighs are yellow. Oh, okay, if anyone listening has not seen this, I encourage you to look it up right now because you are just going to be smacked in the face. Um, I have written down um, not a flattering color on the bulge and lots of emphasis on <laughs> the bulge. Essentially, it looks like this was designed without the human figure in mind, like design wise and in like a 2D kind of, you know, on Photoshop per se. Seems great. You got these cool little angular features. You got you cut off the legs nicely. You've got this square graphic. But oh, you can just see the look on their faces. They are all so uncomfortable because they know the second the flash goes off, their smiles are not what's being documented. Like <laughs> I didn't really notice that. And then now I'm looking. It's like, yeah, you really see. It's the all bulge. you see. Once oh. you see it, you can't unsee it. it. It's literally all you see in the picture. And I, it's true that the guys, their faces, some of them are smiling, but they're, they're smiling a bit like that, that old dude in, in the memes who's trying to hide the pain. 
Yes, it's very like old MSN blushing embarrassed emoji to me. Like you can see the red on their cheeks a little bit and they all have great legs and it's a shame that, you know, those aren't being highlighted. All right, so we're going to move on to current pro kits with Erin. So Erin will give us her, her fashion designer costumer take on current pro kits that are being used in 2022. And the first one that we'll, we'll start with is a women's kit, actually a women's team, which is called Canyon SRAM. So they we didn't talk about it on the on the podcast yet. We, we've been reviewing a lot of those pro kits that have come out, but we didn't yet review this one. And it's the new Canyon SRAM kit, which there's a lot going on there. There's a sort of triangular pattern on the shoulders that has some fluorescent green. There's splatter paint that has red fuchsia, pink, purple, aqua blue, and the bibs are black overall. That's the Canyon SRAM kit. Erin, what did you think about it? Oh. <laughs> I uh, I went to OCAD and in first year OCAD, there's all of these profs that are basically just there because their careers have finally kind of expired. And my one prof was, um, his big thing was stamps. And he'd done a lot of Canadian stamps. And this to me, I'm so sorry, but this is like, oh, Canadian stamp design. Like, just, you know, I'm happy they broke it up with a little bit of black. Um, and I see a Zwift logo there. So that's, that's cool. But, oh, it's just, you know what? It's looking back at Rafa. That's the name, right? Yes, Rafa. They can both, they're both biking alongside each other. I don't know. What do we think? Am I in the wrong here? You're, th this has been a very polarizing kit. Uh, I posted some stuff to our social media and, you know, some people said too much. Some people said great. You know, I it's you're looking at this from, from a fashion perspective. I'm thinking of it a little bit from the way kits are meant to stand out in a race because it's supposed to be sort of about sponsorship and 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 being seen ah yes uh so there could be some positives but the description of it as a like canadian stamp for any non-canadian listeners that is not a good thing <laughs> like i i mean i don't know any country that has good looking stamps i have no clue but as far as i know about my limited knowledge of canadian stamps because who sends letters anymore uh is they're they're not good they're beavers and and moose and whatever and they're not done very well yeah there's a lot going on with that kit i i haven't made up my mind yet but i do find that it seems to go in the same direction that everybody is going in right now which is to just splatter a whole bunch of paint on a jersey and call it a day basically a lot of teams are doing that a lot of brands are doing that and Canyon SRAM, I mean, they've historically had good kits, I would argue, that team. This is a nice kit to look at. My take is there's a lot going on here, and I think it's going to take me until the end of the 2022 World Tour season to, to make up my mind about that kit. So the next current pro kit that we're going to review with Aaron is a kit that we've opined on in our last episode, which is the bike exchange kit. So you'll recall that the men's kit for bike exchange is a powder blue that fades more into a royal blue. And the women's kit has similar bibs, but touches of pink and purple on it. So Aaron, what do we think about the bike exchange kit? It's funny. I'm living in 2021, uh, clearly. So I have written down 2021 and we're still like, try like the gender binary is still present. <laughs> I'm now realizing that this in sports is like, you know, that is very present, but I'm like, come on, y'all. This is like, it's thoughtless. Blue and pink? An astute listener who lives in beautiful Switzerland actually got in touch with us via Instagram, sent us a DM, replied, I think, to one of our, replied to one of our stories to comment on the podcast. And he said, hey, guys, just to let you know, on the bike exchange kit, the reason why the men's kit is blue and the women's kit is pink is because the men's kit, they've actually matched the blue to the bikes that they're riding, which are made by Giant. And the women's kit, they've actually matched it to the pink bicycles that are made by the brand Live that makes those bikes for the women's team. 
And he said that's that's why they went that way. Now, you could ask the question, why are the bikes that color in the first place? And that listener, actually, to his credit, agreed that when I said it was a terrible kit, he said that was an understatement. So he agreed with the general direction of our take. But he he pointed that out. Now, am I satisfied with that as an answer? Probably not. I mean, they can A, paint the bikes whatever color they want. It's a professional team. And B, I mean, I think just sort of Aaron's comment of the binary is that they have it's the same company live in giant. So yes. You would know this, but they've just made the live bike, which could theoretically be a giant in maybe slightly different geometry is the woman's bike. Like live is a, is a, is a woman oriented brand cycling brand, but it's just the exact same company as giant. So if you're a woman and you, I think there's probably a bit of geometry different because of, of men and women's bodies, but essentially if you want, a giant and you like the way a giant looks well guess what you probably should buy a live because that's the woman's version of it that's how it you can pink. ride it as a woman <laughs> and it's pink and it's like giant is aggressive and manly and stuff uh-huh. and live is like more female you know so just giant the, the whole team bike exchange giant live they're really making it clear to us sort of where you know what we know about sort of men and women and, and just sort of sit between those two lines Gotcha. Wow. All right. Let's go to the next current pro cycling kit, which is also a, a women's team. It's the Française des Jeux Nouvelle Aquitaine Futuroscope team that we talked about last week. So the FDJ women's kit for reference, it has white sleeves. It has a blue fade from very, very dark blue to more royal blue. And it also includes the French national champions jersey the blue, white, and red, bleu, blanc, rouge kit that we actually reviewed last week as well. I won't, I won't tell Erin what our take was because we'll hear her take on it. Oh, I know what your take is. Zero out of 10. I'm so sorry. Rocket pop. Rocket oh. pop. I feel like, and I have written down, they look like really nice girls <laughs> in this photo. <laughs> but I, wow. I'm sorry. Like, Okay, fine. You're repping the country and I get it. But it is just such an easy, easy, you know, it's too easy. It's too simple. Give us some fun. Wow. So, Aaron, I actually said this was my favorite kit in the Pro Peloton. And I didn't see the rocket pop before. So I'll give you that. Uh, And I actually, you said it's too easy for the, the French national champ kit. I But I like the simplicity of it. I think... And for context, you wouldn't have seen the many different iterations of national champion jerseys that are out there in the pro peloton. And most of them are horrible. Uh, So the simplicity of this is like, that's why I like it. But again, you would, this is why we have you. We we want the, we want these hot takes and we want to want to know what non-cyclists think. Okay. I'm looking, I'm squinting my eyes right now and I'm really trying to take it in and try and take in the colors. And I will say the white looks nice on the arms, like the way the colors has have been sectioned off. It's nice. It's nicely done in that way. So I'm going to upgrade to a two out of 10. I'm sorry, everyone. And it's not because it's your opinion. It's because for simplicity's sake and the color placement, color blocking sake, fine. Next up with Aaron, we're going to review a few accessories that cyclists wear. The first one is a musette bag. So just for Aaron's benefit, a musette bag is, is just a bag that cyclists will wear to carry stuff in them. Could be sandwiches, usually food, I would say. They use them a lot in pro cycling. When there's a feed station during the race, cyclists will just grab that bag, put it around their shoulder, and then take food and distribute it to their teammates overall. The one that we showed Aaron here is made by MAP, that Australian brand that we discussed earlier. It's uh, very light pink. And it says map on it. So Aaron, what's your what's your take on a musette bag as an accessory? All right. So I did a big scroll through the Google Doc, and this is the first thing that caught my eye. It is in my cart, 20 USD, everyone, in Kreubel. And I will just say, like, you know what? The fanny pack that, like, you know, the smaller, uh, I don't want to call it a shoulder bag, an over-the-shoulder bag, or that that vibe. It's just so practical. I thought for the longest time we were going to have, we were going to get sick of them, 
But I take my note every day. I use it, put my keys, phone, wallet, mask in it. And this has like just a little bit more room. You could throw like a hardcover book in there if you want. Maybe an AirPods case. I'm I'm sold. I'm sold. Okay, moving on to the next piece of cycling accessory that we're going to get Aaron's take on. Double boa shoes. So we're gonna we're, let's let's do both actually we're gonna get Aaron to review both double boa shoes and lace up shoes so we gave her pictures of white shoes the double boa shoes that we're actually showing Aaron is the recently released Q36.5 shoes so they're very simple they're white and they have a, a white double boa so for Aaron's benefit the double boa the boa is that sort of round Thing that you can use to squeeze the laces or to adjust to tighten or release the laces on your shoe. So it's a little piece of technical equipment that is that is tacked onto your shoe. And the lace-up shoes that we showed Aaron. Uh, guys, do you know which brand these are? I didn't put them Those in the box. Specialized. 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 Or S-Works. Are S-Works. they S-Works? Or, yeah, I mean, same thing. But Yeah, so specialized lace-up shoes. They are all white but the heel of the shoe has some black on it. So Aaron, give us your take on double boa versus lace-up shoes. I just want to say one quick thing for the reference of Aaron to understand that the lace-up versus the boa, specifically for us, the double boa, is sort of a like contentious issue among cyclists. People get very passionate about what they think about lace-up from a practicality and style standpoint versus double boa. We've discussed it a lot. The double boa is, you know, sort of accept the only acceptable one. But just so you know, there's there's a battle between laces people and boa people. No, I'm team double boa, ten thousand percent. I feel like if you're wearing a lace while you're cycling, it's the equivalent of wearing a corded headphone. And like, I don't know, you know, when you like walk past a cupboard and you're wearing a corded headphone, it just gets like caught on the knob of the cupboard and just like rips out of your ear i imagine that happening lace tangled in spokes it just doesn't seem practical to me i want to put the double boa on and i never want to take it off like i would wear this shoe to bed it just looks like aerodynamic sock like there's something so sexy about it and i'm i only wear white shoes so this is probably like my preference um but they are incredible Aaron, what color of socks? What color of socks do you wear with your white shoes? Mm, white. I don't know what it is. I love my colors. Like that's my favorite part of fashion. But I white socks, white shoes, hands down. Would you say that double boa? I'm interested in the I guess the the characteristics or the the adge- the adjectives that you use to describe double boa. You use the word sexy. Would you say that double boa is hot people shit? The type of stuff that Italian Alex would wear along with his Panama kit? Absolutely. I am a huge fan of freaky footwear. Like, I think I have a couple pairs of, like, nurses clogs. I know they're pretty in this year, but, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was wearing them first, dug them out of the bin at Value Village. And it's like this to me, seeing this, it's just it's it's creative it's exciting it's inventive i i love to see a freaky shoe and this one freaks me out okay well film and tv costumer fashion designer aaron logan thank you very much for joining cycling fashion week and giving us fresh outsider perspectives on cycling fashion and design this was very interesting to put our long held convictions and views on cycling kit to the test with a real fashion designer or someone who works in the fashion industry so aaron thank you very much for coming on cycling fashion week thank you for having me i'm sorry i haven't participated in a sport since 2012 and uh yeah i'll catch y'all at the map store we'll be sporting our little map bags okay next segment into the canal tony what are you throwing in the canal for us this week uh i am gonna throw not yelling at people on group rides into the canal. And what I mean by that is, you know, different group rides, cycling has gotten really popular. I know we're cold up here in the, the Northern Hemisphere, so this is a little bit of a kind of future thought thing. There's a lot of people who take risky action on group rides, especially as they get bigger and you know people less. And I've been on rides where there's kind of an unofficial sort of marshal who's just typically just kind of an asshole 
but a person with an aggressive personality is going to tell you, you know, what not to do, or, you know, don't cross the yellow line, don't ride three or four abreast. Like, it's just not what you're supposed to do. And I would say I've been, you know, coming through just before the winter, when I was still doing group rides and just sort of hearing stories. There's too many group rides where the ride is chaos and nobody wants to say anything, even the people who sort of have the proper knowledge because they're afraid of hurting people's feelings. And now listen, I get it. I am maybe the most sensitive person in the world. If it was up to me, I would have all my friends call or text me once a day to tell me how special and amazing they think I am so I could be reassured that they still wanted to be my friend. So don't get me wrong. I'm very sensitive, but I think that the dangers of large, fast group ride outweighs people's sort of like personal sensitivity and hurting feelings. And that if you're a kind of more experienced cyclist on a group ride and you see someone who's doing something dangerous and you know to say something, but you're afraid of causing a, a ruckus, say something, just yell at them. I guess you could say it nicely, but I feel like yelling might work a little better. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing people being too nice on the group ride into the canal. I'm with you on that, Tony. I, I, and the only reason I say that is like, I, I'm also anybody who knows me in real life knows I'm quite soft spoken. I don't talk that much. I, when I was first learning to, to bike and get into group rides, I went on a few rides with just one other friend of mine and also named Alex, but not any of the Alex's who's ever been on this podcast. And, you know, I, you know, did a few things that were questionable and he yelled at me and it wasn't a like, you fucking idiot. It was just like, don't warn, don't do that. Uh, and it was because, you know, what I'd done could have possibly been dangerous in a group. Um, and I learned from it and yeah, I maybe felt like a little, uh, a little silly for like, I don't know, a minute or something. And I was, uh, but I just realized that he was just being stern. You're out on the road, you know, there could be big cars coming behind you and you never know. So yeah, I, sometimes that's the best way for, for people to learn. Okay. I'm going to go next with the canal this week. I'm going to throw myself in the canal and credit to me for throwing myself in the canal because it takes a big man to do that, but I'm, I'm going to be the big man this week. Essentially, a few weeks ago, I think our, our first episode of the year, we did our 2022 resolutions. I think Tony was in COVID protocol then, and Tony didn't do his 2022 resolutions, which is probably the smart thing to do, but Warren and I did. And my 2022 resolution in terms of cycling kit was to be more bold was to be more daring was to move away from my comfort zone and to try things I hadn't tried before. And we're about four weeks into the year right now. And I'm already noticing that everything that's coming out that doesn't look like Panorama Studios or Universal Colors, or that's not solid colors, monochrome, very simple stuff. I hate it all the time. And I'm, I'm always fine. You know, my natural inclination is to go back towards the Panorama Universal Colors solid color kits. So as a result, I'm already failing my 2022 cycling resolution. So I'm going to throw myself in the canal. I appreciate your honesty, Alex. It's um, it takes a big man to to admit that. So and good for you for being so self aware. And I I think that's why we're so good is we're all very self aware and very self-critical and we're hard on ourselves and we don't let ourselves wear ugly kit. So that's, what's important. But I will, I will have to step out of my comfort zone a little bit this year. I don't know when it's going to happen. At some point, someone's going to make something that I'll, I'll like, but so far, again, we talked about splatter paint earlier on the podcast. Everyone's coming out with splatter paint. Don't particularly like it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. So the, so what I'm gathering here, unfortunately, is that you will not be also purchasing a rock racing kit alongside me. Uh, can we not get a matching cycling fashion week trio of all three of us with rock racing kit? I'll get one. Yeah, I'm down. I'll get that's, one. that's a bold statement that you can make on your, your local group ride would be to, to, you know, get a rock racing kit. And, and Are we I'm, getting the I'm, body armor? Are we getting the body armor green kit? No, I like the, uh, the, the OG one point. I like the black and the, the black and the white, like real kind of, I guess it's not as Ed Hardy, but it's got this kind of like, I don't, I don't even know how to describe how I'm referencing that, but it, in my head, it's something douchey. You know, what's great on the rock racing.us website. When you look at the product, you actually go to the description of the product. It says made in Italy, 
And then between brackets, it says all rock racing kits from China are fake. To I mean, Tony likes to buy a lot of cycling kit off AliExpress. There's probably some some rock racing options on there next to your spec cell stuff. So fake rock racing is in the canal. Real rock racing right. is real good. rock racing is is legit. Yeah. Yeah. True. Go support rock racing. Uh, you know what? The body armor is pretty awesome too. I don't know. We'll we'll have a maybe we'll do a poll on the on uh we'll do a poll what which which rock, rock racing, racing kit, kit is the best should we one. buy actually let's do that we'll do a poll which rock racing kit should we buy and then sometime this summer we'll post a photo of the three of us wearing the rock racing kits on our instagram at cycling fashion week for my canal by the time when this episode airs um the uh cyclocross world champion championships will have happened we're recording it just a few days before but the cyclocross worlds as people know i'm into cyclocross i race it etc so i bring it up because they're happening in north america uh in fayetteville and it, i think it's the first time they've been in the us in like 10 10 years or so anyway there was a bit of a uh hubbub on the on the on instagram with a lot of the the you know the meme accounts and all that when they announced it's called the walmart cyclocross world championships and that is because of you know the walton family involvement in rafa blah 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 they're big into cycling but there was a lot of negative reaction to walmart sponsoring these world championships so what i'm going to throw into the canal is people complaining about walmart sponsoring the cyclocross world and the reason i'm doing that is we're talking about a sport both in cyclocross and, and in road racing and mountain biking well maybe less so mountain biking, but certainly cyclocross and road racing where teams are sponsored by all sorts of companies. And just because you don't know what Yumbo or Visma is, doesn't make it a good company. Like, yeah, Walmart is a terrible company, 100%. That's, I'm, I'm throwing your, your protest against Walmart sponsoring the worlds into the canal because that's this is how the cycling economy works terrible companies put their money in it pays riders this is just how it works like pow's uh i can't even say the pow's sauce team of cyclocross uh with Eli Isabit and michael van turnhow like it's a like mayonnaise company essentially like what, what are you guys complaining about it's walmart sauce like it, this is how cycling works and it's america walmart's kind of the perfect sponsor so i'm just gonna say a few things here uh, Ineos, I don't know if you'll know what that is, but look that up. Um, Astana, UAE, Team UAE. This is why I hate cyclocross because it's this kind of like, it's like, you know, it's the Portland, Colorado of cycling where it's a bunch of people who think that they're like super edgy and progressive and stuff. So they're bitching about corporate Walmart when you, you know, but it, 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 but the whole sport is a part of that. It's, all these companies are these or your country sponsoring it with all sorts of bad track records and stuff, you know. And like you said, there's probably companies you never heard of that you're fine, what you think you're fine with, but you don't know. So, yeah, like I'm with Warren on this one. I mean, it's like across in general. I don't know. I kind of want to put the canal. One thing though, I want to mention on the on the cycling economy model. That is also, you know, we get accused of having a North American bias by, by some listeners. And as we said on another episode, we embrace that. We, we are North American. But it's looking at it with North American eyes, the cycling economy makes absolutely no sense. I mean, the sport doesn't really generate any revenues. The teams don't really generate any revenues from viewership on television or streaming or things like that. The events do, right? The Tour de France does, which is owned by... ISO, they also own the Vuelta, ASO. RCS, a I ISO in French, Tony, thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, whatever. The the um, Giro is owned by RCS, RCS, Tony, uh, Italian company. They they don't maybe don't speak English that well like you, Tony. But basically, the, these guys derive revenue from viewership, but the teams themselves, I mean, Quick Step doesn't really you know, derive revenue. So they're, they're kind of hoping that the ads work out for them, that the publicity works. But basically these teams are relying on on sponsorships by by random companies. And from a North American perspective, you look at how the NFL works, you look at how MLB works, NBA, it's a very odd model. And 
teams are always folding. I mean, teams are always on the verge of ending up in the canal. Quebec next hash. Astana wasn't paying rider salaries for a bit. It's just a very weird model from a North American perspective. A perfect example of to me is, you know, Lotto Sudel, long, uh, a team with a, a pretty long history in, in pro cycling. It's the fucking lottery. Lottery is bad. Like <laughs> people waste away their, their life savings playing the lottery. Like, come on. Walmart is like they sell some shitty clothes and treat their workers terribly. You know, what's the difference? Okay, another episode of Cycling Fashion Week in the books. Thank you very much to Aaron Logan, television and film costumer, fashion designer, for coming on the podcast to give us her takes, her analysis of various pieces of cycling kit that we wear and love. Aaron, that was great. Thank you for bringing an outside perspective. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Tony. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Cycling Fashion Week. Send us DMs, send us emails. We usually reply to all those, maybe not right away, but we try to reply to all of those from listeners. Send us your bikes to review as well. We haven't gotten many of those lately. Maybe we've been harsh on some of our latest. We rate your bikes for free, and maybe that's why we're not getting bikes anymore. But honestly, please do, because we... We'll try to give you the most honest and constructive feedback on your bike. Follow us on Instagram, as I mentioned before. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and please leave a review. As I mentioned earlier, we laughed reading some of those reviews out there. So please leave a review, hopefully a five-star review. Leave a little comment as well. Thank you for listening. We will be back in a couple of weeks with another episode of Cycling Fashion Week. Take care.